So it's my pleasure to introduce today David Culler. David Culler is the, a professor of computer science and a member of the EECS faculty, the EECS faculty at UC Berkeley. Um, he received his BA from UC Berkeley and a master's and PhD from MIT. Uh, he has served as co-director of Berkeley's Data Science Planning Initiative, which is the main reason why we are collaborating with him these days. He's, a, he's been a chair of the EECS department, a faculty director of the Citrus Sustainable Infrastructure Initiative and founding director of Intel Research at Berkeley. Uh, he won the Okawa Prize in 2013 and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, an ACM fellow and an IEEE fellow. He was named one of Scientific American's top 50 researchers and the creator of one of MIT Technology Review's 10 Technologies That Will Change the World. It's a real honor to have you here today, David. We started working with David about three years ago through our collaboration with AMP Lab, and it's been fascinating to see the evolution of the data science education initiative that you have led at UC Berkeley and how it has touched you know, the lives of every undergrad at UC Berkeley. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Vani. A bit of an understatement. Yeah, Vani showed up uh, on some visit to AMP Lab and got a little indication of what we were doing. And a check arrived in the mail the next day, and we had credits, and we were off and running. So she and the team have been invaluable. So. Um, this is the first time I've given this talk or anything like it. In fact, I've never had a chance to talk on this topic for more than about 20 minutes. So I took the chance to expand it a little bit, but I'm, I'm also hoping that this is much more of a discussion. So I've got a good bit of material, but I hope we can do this interactively. Um, this rather bold title, um, I think we're in this transformational moment. I, in my abstract, I said a little, we're in a once in 50 year kind of time in the life of the research university. And you know, the other two were the Land Grant Act in 1872 and you know, the combination of the GI Bill and the rise of, of physics. So it's at that scale, if you look anywhere throughout the country, you see this incredible angst and turmoil about the, the nature of the data revolution and how it's really kind of causing universities to rethink what they do and how they're organized and what does it mean to teach and you know it's part of that broader so that's been going on largely driven by uh, students so one part of it where to begin um, uh, back in 2014 we formed a data science education rapid action team uh, to in some sense step back and say if you're really thinking of this as a part of what it means to be educated in the 21st century, as well as the more focused needs of the emerging research and industry, uh, how would you really think about it from scratch? So this was the, the charge to this rapid action team. Uh, faculty from not just EECS and CS, but history and physics and polit political science and information um, really across the board. So um, what came out of that? Well, um, uh, a new course um, we'll talk about um, foundations. If this is really so fundamentally important, it begins from the moment you set foot on campus. Um, why would you create one? You would create dozens. Um, this sense of connector courses, I'll fill more of this, but just take a little glance at the subject matter of the data science courses this term at the freshman level. Um, uh, so, and you've all seen the analyses from McKinsey and this, that, and the other, and, and the um, great uh, shortage. Um, so, um, this is what data science looks like at Berkeley. Um, uh, in, so here's kind of a scale. We've gone from zero to 1,200 enrollments a semester, 2,000 students in two years. Um, in that foundations course, those connectors, and creating a whole set of advanced courses and whatnot. So 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's driving this, how it's come, where it came from. But I thought, so just two days ago, the students put out a video. This is following Vani and Layla did this amazing Microsoft video, which I also have to show you if you haven't seen. But um, I thought uh, I ought to begin by just letting the students kind of speak for themselves. So let's see if we succeed here. To me, data science is this really exciting new field that empowers people to really explore any question that may interest them. Certainly in Berkeley, I can feel this wave of data science. <laughs> no, you can't see it. Uh, uh, and I think it's a very uh... good thing. I think the vision that every student, regardless of uh, the stage she or he is at in undergrad, can be exposed to you know, data and critical thinking. Okay, here. So we'll do it this way. Data science was that I immediately saw how applicable it was to everything else I was learning. From analyzing neural networks in my cognitive science courses, got pretty slick, to hearing right? about how it is used to predict and interpret election results in the news. I actually never thought that data would be this applicable to my city planning minor. Currently in the class, I am working on a project analyzing data on the happiest cities in America, scraping information from sites like Yelp and Google to determine location of coffee shops and parks, and figuring out that determines the happiest parts of the cities in America. Data science is already transforming the academic environment across all sorts of fields. Historians now have the ability to read previously illegible documents, and ecologists can model populations at much larger scales. The students who are working on data science are often really trying to find connections to whatever else they're studying. So I see a lot of questions you know, from a student who is studying political science and taking a data science course about trying to understand how the ideas that they've learned elsewhere really connect in, so they become uh, capable of doing interesting things really early on. We did a project on any correlations between water usage data in California as well as like income data. So we're trying to see, do people with higher incomes use more or less water than people with lower incomes? And it's just so interesting. Both the Data 8 and the Study 8 has opened up my mind to like the probability theory and how inner workings of data and associations work. It's so cool. So it's a really powerful way to get the underlying truth of what's going on in the world around us. Not bad, huh? <clears throat> okay. I'll, um... If we have time, I'll, I'll come back and show you the Microsoft one, too. Um, it, it's great. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go away. Uh, hmm, interesting. Um, OK. So uh, where did this begin? Um, so <clears throat> of course, how could you be talking about this without stepping back and, and remembering Jim, right? So, so much of this began back in 2000, where Jim and, and Alex and, uh, really began to recognize how this is completely shaping. Yeah, I can't, it's hard. Um, so that in, of course, more recently, you know, Jim was always 15 years ahead of his time, and he certainly was on this. Um, within Berkeley, you know, of course, in that time frame, absolutely every field, you know, throughout the nation was being transformed uh, from data poor to data rich. We know that. And, you know, in 2012, with the presidential big data initiative and AMP Lab and X data and that, you know, coming from the, the technical side, um, as we launched into the more Sloan uh, grant process that gave rise to the Berkeley Institute of Data Science. They had us, they wouldn't let us write a proposal, had us take inventory. And, you know, what you saw was that that picture on the top had already pervaded the university. There were 300 faculty that showed up on a moment's notice to participate in that. And it was absolutely everywhere. But um, there was this other message for me that came through, which was those faculty were saying, 
the grad students I need to recruit into my lab for the next project, the places that are actually at the frontiers of my field, there is no undergraduate education in the world that is preparing them for that. So, you know, in some sense, the most basic mission of the research university of training the next generation of researchers, a gap had opened in that. We, and we generally across the entire world had, had failed. Um, and we see this as well. D-Lab is a social science data lab, 2,500 grad students a year showing up there. Of course, the students had seen this long ago. This is a picture of the black line there is the total number of freshmen. Um, the colors are the uh, enrollment in the introductory computer science courses, and the um, orange is in statistics courses. And you could go look at the majors in CS or in statistics, and a huge fraction of those are also double. And of course, all of this was just the university microcosm of what was going on in, in the rest of the world. So the blueprint, well, OK, so the question was, how do you orient that university, that instrument, now to begin to really make this a fundamental part of all college education. So you can think of this as it's 6,000 students wide, it's four years high, and you know today it's populated with a bunch of majors and courses and whatnot. So the concept was from the moment you arrive as a freshman, really this integrated experience of computational thinking, inferential thinking in the context of real world problems, make that available and accessible to the entire student body. I didn't say make it a requirement. How do you, that's a question of scale, it's a question of access, but really a modern way of thinking, also recognizing no matter how brilliant a job you did with that, you could not do justice to the incredible diversity of interests and background of the student body of a world-leading public university. So take a more modular approach. Um, so the idea we invented there was this notion of connectors that would be little two-unit freshman courses. They'd be taken ideally at the same time, and um, they would be in all sorts of different fields. And you say, oh my god, how could you ever do that? Then faculty would actually have to look at each other's syllabi in order to zip them together. And the answer is yes, that's exactly right. They would actually have to pay attention. But um, so at the very least, this would be the new student experience, that that introduction and they go on through their program. But and of course, you know, you'd have to think through how do you adapt to the K-12 and not everybody's ready to do that and so forth? This is really subversive because what we're really empowering faculty to do is to then introduce data analytics modules throughout the program so that the more typical course of a student would come back to this knowledge they work so hard to learn and you know, give faculty license throughout. But also if you imagine if you've got 3,000 students a year going a semester, 6,000 students a year, and maybe these are smaller courses, maybe only 100, you've got 50, 60, 70 faculty a year that are actually throughout campus teaching as a part of this program. And that begins to infect all of those other fields because it's a generational turnover. And then, of course, you go build a major, and we'll talk more about that. And we had this concept of really building at the upper division when you've gained scientific maturity, mathematical maturity, pure and simple maturity, you know what you more what you want to be. Um, and that um, that might be a deeper experience that would be part of all sorts of different majors or um, a major in data science that would draw upon some of the, con the concentrations being the uh, statistical and mathematical, the systems and, uh, uh, and engineering, the social implications, um, and that out of that you could draw upon a minor. And we usually think of those things as orthogonal to their major. But in this world, that's probably not the right way to think about it. You'd like to engage the major. So the capstone of the minor might well be offered in the major that it comes from, drawing data back into that pursuit, perhaps um, into the 
So that was our blueprint. And I was asked today, how are we doing? Well, from day one, the students have been asking this, will this be ready in time for me? So we've been laying the tracks as students are running along uh, trying to get a hold of them. So that's introduction. Um, what I thought I'd do is spend a chunk of time talking about this Data 8 course, give you a sense of that, um, touch on some of these connectors, touch on we're now piloting that upper division gateway DS100 and, and give you a little, little sense of it. So um, that plan for the time ahead. Um, this began uh, as a pretty broad collaboration, seven faculty from EEC, STAT, Information School, um, over the spring while the university couldn't figure out any of this to go create this fundamental commingling of the CS and STAT concepts on real data. So, you know, you learn computing while you're doing something interesting with data. You learn statistical concepts um, um, by observing what's interesting and that kind of turning the uh, conceptual process around where those symbolic views of it rather than a bunch of formulas really serve to codify the intuition. And then this is punctuated through explorations. Um, so this is, you know, just a little taste. Um, um, you know, students at the freshman level doing bootstrapping and hypothesis testing. In a classical stat program, you'd be lucky if you got there as a senior. Okay? So, um, uh, I thought, so, um, these two faculty from STAT and CS tend to ping pong, um, although each of them does a fair amount of lectures in support of the other, and we get to mix in. Um, so I thought I'd let Ani Adhikari speak for herself. So I brought her with me today. And so she offers a view from a statistics perspective. Um, look, there's three make steps. Um, Formulating the question and method is hugely important. Um, the visualization and you know, calculation and interpretation of this in domains that make sense. And Ani would say, um, the common approach in statistics is to take all of that and reduce it to that. It's all focused on the calculation. She's very proud of the Berkeley statistics history with Friedman and so forth, of um, really emphasizing the rest of that. And um, you know, what's happened here, bringing us full circle, is that it's not just a matter of formulas, that it's really putting the emphasis on the problem as a whole, but not get so hung up on the calculations, instead really utilize the power of computation to, to appreciate that. Okay, you can see this is easier to say from a stat point of view. It was very cute when, when John was giving these slides. Um, uh, ben Yu, another stat member, was very anxious about the first one. I was ready to come and, and defend it. Okay, so, so, okay. Accessibility. So we've had a lot of conversations back and forth, you know, exactly what are they learning about Azure and so forth. Um, the notion here is everything is focused on the pedagogical concept of what they need to know. So what do you begin with? A browser, period. No files, no studios, no compilers, no nothing. You have a browser, you can go compute. So that's been, everything is in a Jupyter notebook. All of the lectures, the textbook itself, all of the labs. Um, They've never seen anything else, right? They carry a computer around. That doesn't mean you compute. So um, for their point of view, the world lives there. Um, now, one of the things we did at the beginning, and I'll do a little bit more on this, was to create a data frames abstraction that, if you will, took all of that intuition you developed, you know, since you were in third grade working with Excel, and they do since third grade, right? So this is an ordered list of name columns. But you never read Pandas documentation or Matplotlib or NumPy or any of the rest. I'll say a little bit more. And yes, it's in Python. So you have one powerful data structure that does absolutely everything. And it's even easy to 
underestimate how big a change learning to compute in a notebook environment is. And I'm the child of one of the uh, earliest interactive computing, but for <laughs> what does it mean that for these students, computing is part of a kind of digital narrative? It's a computational essay. In general, it begins with a question and access to some raw data and proceeds through a series of steps of distilling and formulating arguments and computational reasoning to arrive at a conclusion. That's very different from it's a bunch of stuff that happens in solving puzzles. And right? So this notion that it's presented before them in a kind of literary way actually makes a huge difference to huge segments of the population that might not have uh, come out of a traditional CS environment. OK, and of course, part of it is make sure you can do all of that with a really rich mix of data. So it's not just numbers, it's text, it's, it's shapes, it's images. It's, um, we haven't actually done sounds in video, but we talked about that a lot. OK, so um, uh, everything about the program as a whole is on data.berkeley.edu. Everything about the course is at data8.org. All of the offerings, um, I've given you a little bit of a snapshot, but I encourage you to go there and look at it yourself where you could actually read it. Um, you almost have to look at it to, and to see this kind of interweaving of computational and statistics and how far they go. I'll do a little bit more. But what that misses is the thing that's really important, drawing sound conclusions about populations you cannot observe from the samples of them that you have. And it's amazing how that deeply that's lost. But this is all about the inference part, right? Not just the calculation. But how do I generalize that to the original problem? Um, so everywhere throughout, it comes back to that, that question. OK. So, um, Here's a sharp, a little bit of a of a higher level view of what's in there, and um, okay, so you know, beginning with really the what and why, starting very early on with understanding causality as opposed to correlation, and uh, experimental process. Um, yes, they learn programming in Python and the set of sequence types. So basically, they see tables and numpy arrays, tables and arrays, numbers. Um, this is actually kind of interesting because it has all of the relational operators built into it. So you know, the step to SQL is some weird syntax. Um, really understanding randomness and probability from working about it. So it's not about p-values and t-sets. It's about empirical p-values. So, so many of those really difficult concepts um, come out of it naturally. You don't start by learning formulas. You don't learn one statistic. You learn a whole family of statistics. It's not just mean. There's lots of them. You learn those higher order things you can do with statistics, like permutation tests and other kind of evaluations about the right statistics. Um, hypothesis testing to where they really understand, because they've been simulating it, what a null hypothesis is. Um, and so they're being driven by bootstrapping and permutation tests from very early on. So you can think of this as a set of first half of building the two up so that then you really can get into prediction, classification, um, uh, and um, learning at that freshman level. Okay? Um, so this is pretty interesting if you're not presupposing that you have calculus, much less linear algebra, and yet you want to get them all the way where they can do meaningful jobs of doing uh, inference. Yeah? yeah so are there any prereqs to this at all? Getting into the university. OK. And it's a one quarter class or two quarters? One semester, so 15 weeks. Students have had statistics or no. a cop's eye in high school, or who cares? Who cares? Um, 
Both of those are considered a challenge rather than an opportunity because a huge amount of it is unlearning what they might have learned there. I'll show you some data of that mix. Um, and, and yes, the thing we know about computer science course of the, the hacker jock that wants to show all they compute, there's a similar one of we know all of these definitions of things. So a lot of it is unwinding that to get back to understanding sound inferences about that which you can't see directly. David, what yeah. does SAT and ACT scores tell you about your incoming preparation mathematically for this? <clears throat> the, so there's no question this, was an issue, this is built for absolutely everybody at Berkeley, which is an incredibly high bar across the board. Um, I'll show you some of the stats. You know, there's 70 different majors represented in this student pool. Um, we're only now beginning to track them through. So um, every week, so then you, you get into really how do you construct this. Um, so um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you have a one hour lecture um, now at the scale of 700 students. That was oh so this semester. It was 500 last semester. It will be 1,000 next semester. Um, between the Wednesday lecture and the Friday lecture, you have two hour uh, hands-on labs that are carefully tuned to take the thing that from Friday through Wednesday you've been learning and now master it. So it's running like clockwork. And you notice if you go back to that syllabus, how, um, every single lecture draws upon some interesting piece of data or two. It's carefully chosen to bring out the concepts that you're getting to there. Um, it's been fascinating over the four semesters to see, I mean, these two people are brilliant instructors and how they've refined it. So I'll show you a little piece of that as now the data sets even recur throughout the semester so you get a sense of your own intellectual progress throughout. Um, so the emphasis is on visual understanding by computational means, and it's a rigorous course, but the formalisms um, come out from the observation. I sat in through the first pilot. I thought when the central limit theorem finally came out, the students were you know, going to say hallelujah. They, they, you know. So um, there's three major projects. Um, in addition to these weekly things, I'll give you a taste of the current ones. And then punctuated with these explorations into social questions that are raised throughout to keep that conversation going. Um, so dig in just a little deeper. OK, so um, I, I actually think what we've done with tables is, is more than just a tool for teaching, but it's beautiful for that. Um, so one data structure to do everything um, you need at the early stage to learn, the really hard, subtle stuff that gets you into pandas sequence. So don't try to compete with everything R ever thought about. It's an ordered collection of label columns of anything, um, which means if I index it, I get an array, which means the entire world of SciPy and whatnot, I can gracefully, without ever reading any of that, begin to work with. Um, uh, of course, a row of that is your record, your dictionary, your tuple, the rest of those things that we're used to. Um, so the um, uh, columns are homogeneous in type and length. Basically, you can. Point a table to almost any data in the world, stick it into a table, and you know, do all of the visualization that you would like to do. And, and this is all um, uh, Folium and Matplotlib and whatnot. Tomorrow it may turn into Plotly or D3 or whatnot that can continue to evolve. So really quickly on, students begin to point to data, suck it into a table, start to visualize it. And then it's to do interesting things with it which is then all the operators. So the first thing you do is to provide all the relational operators. You don't need to have a query processing and a lot of sophistication there to get there. So they're now very comfortable with slicing and dicing this and putting it together in various ways, um, including joins. So you can start to take different data sources and put them together. But then you also throw in all of the statistical operators. So of course, bins are histograms, but how about taking a sample? 
a random sample, you know, or a permutation. So most of the things that they might ever think to do, they can do on a table from the beginning. And, and you could learn a little bit from Excel <clears throat> that some of those non-traditional operators like pivots and whatnot were actually really important, which allows you to take values and turn them into labels and back and forth. So that's it. Everything they do, you can do that in a lecture at early on and then just use it throughout. Um, so that's one of the things that's in GitHub. Uh, it does live on top of, so um, you can go back and forth to pandas or CSVs. Questions there? Um, of course, I'm, uh, what's underneath the question? What do you mean? Because you're going to continue to evolve this, right? Yeah, so um, what happens here is not so much where it's backed, um, because all these things end up being in memory anyways. So it's more a question, uh, uh, how much pandas is under, do you try to do all of this as a thin layer over pandas and whatnot? We ended up choosing not to do any of that. Um, and it's actually, I'm really happy about that, because What's underneath this is also a really great, the rest of what you need to learn in your first and second semester or right there in the implementation of it. So it's actually quite nice that it's built from scratch, which is another, I should say, the, one of the things that's come out of our computer science program was this notion of it's not teaching you a fixed set of things, it's empowering you to realize anything you could want, need to use, you could build yourself. And so we, we wanted to take that notion, you're not just a consumer of data, you're a producer, but it's a consumer producer in a chain because what you produce somebody else may consume, and that's true for the technology as well as the data products. And really get that prosumer concept to be in there from the beginning. Um, um, the other piece that's kind of related to that, um, the only way any of these things are possible was this change of student culture. And this happened first in the computer science program. Um, during the downturn, we grew as fast as we did before the internet bubble, and during the recovery, we grew at three times that rate. And the only way it was possible was this, stu this culture of students teaching students. So students take the course, they then grade for the course, they're then a lab assistant, and then they TA the course. They're incredibly influential, but they also develop a lot of the technology. So we built that into the data science program for the day, first, from day one. So the, you got to build this pipeline. So the first semester was 100 students, but those students became, and we've actually had a whole student team studying students, doing essentially market validation within the student body, asking those questions that only students can ask of each other and filtering it back. So almost all the technology here is also student built. Um, John and I got our hands a little bit in this before the students tore it away from us. Um, this is a taste of the three projects this term. Um, last term they did, it was during the drought, that was timely. Um, so this beautiful one early on looking at, you know, why can't we solve world hunger? Um, and <clears throat> uh, Hans Rosling died this, this year, so it's also sort of a, a tribute to him. Uh, the notion of natural experiments. So this is looking, you know, the U.S.-Canada border ends up being this wonderful natural experiment, if you will, in this very terrible question. Uh, so they end up looking at pretty deep social issues, um, and uh, you know the 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 pieces that are down underneath that, um, you know, is about is the thing that you're observing, uh, you know, really a matter of the population or the sample you're taking of the population. Um, uh, you know, getting into really understanding how to formulate a hypothesis test and draw conclusions. Um, 
This one's end up being a K nearest neighbors exercise. So classification with the set of mathematical skills where you basically can take averages of things. Um, and it's pretty, pretty sweet. Um, questions? How challenging is this for the students? It's an interesting one to measure. Um, <clears throat> The self-reported workload is within norms. So that was really important. Um, all students are quite challenged by something in it. So I'll show you the demographics a little bit. We really tried to build this for freshmen. Um, we're disciplined with that, but it's got juniors and seniors and graduate students and faculty in it. And even those find that they're, it's worth their while. It's quite challenging. So uh, <clears throat> this was a really interesting, you know, with the students that we have, it's really important to challenge them. Um, and at the same time, you're really trying not to threaten them. Right? So it needs to be a gateway, not a gatekeeper. Um, so we think the answer is just right for our students, but it's an ongoing question. Sure. Uh, so this looks beautiful. Uh, is there any downside to this approach? Do students maybe never go back and get more of the fundamentals they need for statistics or computer science? Does it hurt them somewhere in the future? Yeah. Um, too early to tell. Not um, So there's no question this is way better than any statistics course that we've ever offered. So one example of that, we went back. There were 22. Um, uh, programs that had a statistics requirement, and 20 of them now accept this, or, because you get to the other, what we did, one of the connectors is a statistics, I call them the data eight, that do the rest of the theory you would have got in the introductory statistics for majors. And I taught a similar course on the CS side. So you could take four units of classic intro to CS and four units of classic, eight units, or you could take this and two units of the two connectors. So a couple of the majors like econ require a combination. So I'd say absolutely no downside in that respect. Um, you'll see some other data. Um, students love this. They got, they're really excited. They're beating us up for not having a major soon enough. Um, um, yeah. So I thought I would take uh, just one vignette of this question of how do you really approach this differently when you try to, because <clears throat> I've given shorter presentations, you know, followed by you know, NYU's master's program, where the answer is, well, we basically cover what Berkeley is doing in their freshman course, which is true. So, you know, how do you actually do it that early? So I thought I would take this kind of classic, um, you know, uh, if and how is Y related to X, your, your classic prediction question. So. Um, in week three, lecture 10, where they're learning functions, all right, there's, they've gotten through, you know, iteration and expressions and learned tables a little bit, and they're seeing the power of functions. Um, and truly going back to at the days of Darwin, Darwin's cousin, um, you know, with all of the eugenics, you know, and so that 1800s data about the height of parents or the average height of the parents as a predictor of the height of the child and and surely you can so um, of course you could plot it and early on you can start that question of gee there seems to be a relationship here and you know of course he you don't just breed ever more bigger people and you can start teasing them in this question. Okay, yeah. Is plotting built into the table? Yes. Oh, cool. Yes. So you drop it into a table, you can plot it, you can scatter it, you can histogram it, you can build, and anything you can do um, ought to also produce a new table, right? So whether it's a histogram or a bin. So yes, that's all built in. And you might ask, could you put a fit a line through this? Well, you're saying, well, what does it mean for these things to be related? So. Um, I found my 
sophomore text on linear algebra. I thought it was great, actually, this, I think, first edition of Gil Strang. You know, this question of an over-constrained system, does this problem actually arise in practical applications? <laughs> And, you know, how would I project this vector onto the column space and is it numerically stable? And then it goes on from there, right? So what happens instead is you could say, oh, well, you know, here's a nice function. Uh, if I took a height, I could take sort of the points around the space and I could take that average as um, a prediction of the child's heights from... And then I get those points. So that's a little exercise in functions, taking some average. And you might, so you know, they get to write this. You may notice selection is built into tables, um, you know, as, and you know, you can have an, another operator here. So they're, they're learning about that, but they're being teased by this question. So six weeks later, they've learned statistics, they've learned empirical distributions, they learn sample means, they've learned confidence intervals built on those empiric means, variations. They've understood and they got correlation coefficients. So, they've seen those peaches. And once you convert it over into standard units, then this relationship is just the correlation coefficient. So, then it's that line and how there's a different, and if you do one little change of variables, another little computing exercise, then you get the line that would come out of it, which you can then compare with what you learned at the beginning. Okay, that got you regression. But then you want to come back to that slope, is that real? Or is that just an artifact of the sample that you've had? So at the next lecture, all right, so we've changed different data set. We could, here I've switched over to one that happens to have a bunch of data on maternal characteristics and child, birth weight, gestation, maternal age, height, pregnancy, weight, whether they smoke. What, and at this point, can I just do a little demo? Okay. so. Why don't I do in five minutes what would be a 50-minute lecture in this? And it'll give you a sense of the tools. Okay, so this you can see. So let's scroll down here. And I'm going to grab this lecture on sample means, linear regression, least squares, residuals, regression inference. That slope that I seem to appear, is it real? And so I'm going to go open that. That went a little fast. So this is what the students have seen throughout. Uh, boom, you notice what I have. I'm living in my hub. You can actually sort of see me, this particular lecture. In there, I fired off an instance I've cloned from GitHub down into my personal space in this over Kubernetes on some cloud somewhere in the world. OK? <clears throat> and um, let me make that. Can you sort of read that? Uh, let's make it bigger. Okay, that's probably reasonable. Um, let me go ahead and, and clear all of this and, and kind of start from scratch. Um, okay, so uh, there's a little bit of uh, stuff that you bring in, basically that data science that you import. Um, in this particular case, that set of mathematics that's on the slide is now captured in some very simple functions that they've been building up themselves for doing that. So they would have had that built in. Um, <clears throat> they make, here's a little, this one happens to develop this notion of regression and, and to talk about inference a little bit more. So we have a little simulation where um, if I took things that were in some relationship, and threw in some noise. Here's the line that was truth in an Oracle world in the data. But what I see is actually this. And what my fit was giving me that. Um, and uh, so 
um, I can talk about the relationship between the regression line and the true line. All right, this is the real message underneath. Okay, so you bring that out, and if you like, you can show that, you know, if you use a lot more points, then that relationship is, is more realistic, and, you know, for a thousand points. Okay, so we've already got this notion of reality versus what we're observing, and now we go back and we take a data set, in this case, all that information about babies and births and whatnot, and, um, of course, we might want to look at what that is. So um, that's built in. There's the distribution of birth weights and gestational days. And if only obstetricians understood statistics, wouldn't life be OK? Um, and we could plot their relationships. We could see, yeah, there does seem to be a, a relationship between how many weeks and how large and what is that. And, and at this point, they understand the um, uh, residual, and, and they could go pull that out. Um, uh, almost half an ounce per day is that slope. And the question is, is that real? Um, so you could imagine if you, so here, they're doing bootstrapping, where this operator is giving them a sample with replacement of that same data set. So that you can begin, and now let's do that a few times. Well, they look kind of similar. But, um, and you know, every one of those had the same 1174, but with permutations. So if I did that thousands of times, okay, let's go do it 5,000 times, and it'll take about 16 seconds. So, you know, we wouldn't have done this years ago, but, uh, what will come back is I'll get a table which contains all the slopes. OK, great. Here I have the distribution of the slopes from thousands of samples uh, bootstrapping from that population. And of course, at this point, you know, I can turn that into a function. I could do that. I could look at bootstrapping the slope. I could look at the residuals. Um, okay. Um, oh, I see what I've got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, so I could go ahead and say, look, here's the 95% confidence interval. I can really say quite confidently about this property of that population. Whereas if I asked, what is the effect of maternal age on gestation days, I might get something that looks like it had a line to it. But if I really go and look at that, I cannot reject the null hypothesis. Okay, So they're getting quite a lot of power quite early on in this experience to really come back to that those original questions. Um, this particular one goes off now to do a better job of prediction. So, OK, if I've got 300 days of pregnancy, what's the distribution of dates I can look? Give you a sense? So that's kind of a typical day in data eight. But you can see it's built up over uh, 10 weeks of experience. Yeah? How and when and how do you deal with outliers? Like, you know, so sometimes there are outliers that really, you know, you have to clean your data. OK, so um, there's several pieces of that. <clears throat> so what we don't do in this course is data wrangling. We've been very careful to prepare things. Now, um, there's lots of outliers in this data set, tons of them, which is you, the other is develop statistical techniques or computational statistic techniques that are very robust to outliers. And this is a great example of that. We didn't have any conversation about what distribution this was. So that is part of it, is these kind of modern techniques are also very resilient in that respect. Even when you get into student independent student projects, you don't you steer them away from data wrangling? Um, because they could get totally wrapped up in um, it. Not entirely. Okay. Um, so what happens there um, is it varies a lot by instructor in the, in the courses. So some of them have chosen to. In the later on, very important. 
Um, but um, really easy to get to get lost in that. Okay, so uh, okay, just in case we didn't get to do demo, we had it here. So part of what I wanted to show there, you could uh, you can imagine what does it take to import this course? Well, I can run all of that with Jupyter on my machine. Okay, go at it, <clears throat> and I get all of the joys of all of the different machines. Um, of course, at modest scale, you stand up a Jupyter Hub. And um, uh, at, at what is also here is a whole bunch of other tools for doing auto grading, for doing mastery learning. A bunch of other things have been developed around that ecosystem. Um, so now what we do, and this has been part of the pacing, is that's all dockerized on top of a Kubernetes. So we, have lot, we can have lots of different hubs for different parts of the curriculum that have different underlying images. Um, and um, it integrates directly into the campus authentication. So this looks as much a part of the student experience. It's way easier than signing up for a course. And basically, all of the workflow goes through GitHub. So the, the instructor is essentially pr pushing or their materials, and when I touch that link, it went out and it cloned into my workspace there, if you will, from the repository for the particular course. And that allows you to support the fact that the materials a student sees evolves week by week and, and so forth. Um, so this has been a lot of the conversation with Zvani and team and so forth about you know, the readiness of various platforms. Uh, the business school is standing up this stuff this summer, but they have to run it on their own clusters because they're the business school, whatever, that, um, um, and we do too. Yeah. Questions? Please. So I have a question about the things you demonstrated. I thought they are just uh, part of the traditional statistic framework, right? Um, the, the Try to find it. You will be lucky to get these kind of techniques as a senior. There's no question that the notion. <laughs> the word you're doing your program language, we're doing visualization, but uh, the techniques like, like the A B test, like the regression. So there's no question that A B test is not going to go away. You know, how am I sure that this is different than that? And regression is not going to go away. But, you know, part of the. You know, when we do it in the upper division course, then it looks like this, right? It's about how do I minimize the loss function over this space. And, you know, we do the whole bit on that. The question is, how do I robustly put it in students' hands even before they've had calculus? So that, you know, then they're prepared to do it. They, and they certainly haven't had linear algebra yet. Tenant is pushing it down, right? From, uh, pushing it down and more robust computational techniques. You know, they see not an idealization of the data, but the actual data, which moves you away from a whole set of traditional statistical approaches to these computational approaches. So try to find bootstrap and permutation tests in the textbooks, right? Much less. How do I take that and derive p -val empirical p-values? I mean, we didn't do a student t-test anywhere in here, which means you don't have a lot of conversations about those yet. Yeah? Can you talk a little bit about the labs? Like, do you see us one hour per day or two hours? So there, um, per week, there's, so there's three one-hour lectures and one two-hour lab in a given week, and the lab will be in the second one. And I haven't got to connectors yet, but they will tend to be in the Monday, Tuesday. So that the week will ends up being split between us. In general, they are. Yeah. And how many uh, students per section or lab? Or um, so twenty-five. So that's a lot of TAs, right? Uh, so what happens? This is why it is a lot of TAs. Um, but each of those labs will typically have TA, lab assistant, and often other helpers. And then we've kind of carefully done the physical layout of those so that there's pods of groups and you can see where people are. So there's a certain art to that too. I wanted to give you a sense of the explorations. So 
Um, uh, Dave Wagner uh, did one on uh, informational privacy as a great example. And uh, part of what you're seeing here is the mix of media and whatnot. So what he does is starts with license plates readings out of the Oakland Police Department, which are the own interesting, you know, a um, uh, um, California public information request out of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and ACLU lawsuits, you know, this question of what is public. It was observed in the public, does it belong to the public? And so it, it now is, is public. And you take that data and you, know, you throw it onto a map, which again, you can do with a table because it's a table, GIS, perfectly good kind of data. And you look at all of that, you immediately see it's not uniform over the city. It's concentrated in certain parts of town. Okay, lots near the police station. And if you wanted to do the correlation with socioeconomic status, you'd see correlations there too. But what he does is he takes a um, newspaper article on the mayor of Oakland who got a lot of parking tickets, and it shows her license plate. So you filter it for the license plate. And you see, oh, yeah, a lot of time around the courthouse and this, and this. it also goes over here a lot. And you say, hmm, let's look for patterns like that. Okay, who spends a lot of time near the fire station? Oh, that might be the fire chief. And oh, where do else do we see them? And oh, they look like they have, they're off in Little League field. So there's a point about 20 minutes into this lecture where the students feel, I'm invading somebody's privacy on public data. Okay, so we're trying to teach judgment. It's not this is illegal, it's not this, but it has to make it right. And so it opens up these really important questions about the data just because you have it versus your personal responsibility. So here's what the demographics look like. Um, this was for last semester. Um, we were slightly majority female uh, and uh, significant no response, so maybe large. Um, uh, out of the 500 students, 60 majors, 85 if you count double major combinations this is early on. I've got this for two years. So um, you can see, so spring goes before fall. So computer science is dropping. Econ, psychology took off uh, versus statistics. Uh, business, cog sci, applied math, eeks, public health, MCB. And then it just goes on and on of a very large number of different majors. So we really have, this is a real question. Could we make this work for the entire student body? Yeah. Do you know why the research in the psychology department, um, they have a separate psychology class? They do. Uh, so um, very often it's specific things. Uh, a part of that was waking up to it. Part of that was getting... Uh, some of these other pieces, a big part of it was their advisors said, go take it. Um, now, in that particular course, they also advised them to take the methods course that was being taught in R at the very same time, and that was actually not a very good idea. Uh, so things can get a little complicated. But um, so it actually is. And you, you know, there's other questions that are interesting, like tracing these folks going forward. Um, yeah. I noticed that the no programming versus strong programming are almost equal. Yeah. Uh, do they, yeah, that's the correct. Strong programmers tend to immediately help the, their peers in the class. Yeah, so this is a really interesting piece of social dynamics of how to do that, how to engineer that well. Um, uh, there is a sense of some of these folks feeling a little intimidated by some of those folks. Um, so that's been a, a Thing that we're continuing to work on. Um, and you also notice here, although we were majority first and second year, seniors and juniors, grad students and, and others. Um, the, uh, from an a ethnicity point of view, it basically models campus. How do we compare against the intro to CS class? Against? The intro to CS, the 61. The, the top to the gender. Yeah. And the so um, we're making huge progress on that course. Um, 
it's nowhere near this blend. In fact, if you look in this semester, uh, the ratio here is down to about 44% female, in large part because it has a larger influx from that class. Um, so we actually um, are getting close to parity there after quite a long time. Um, but you have nothing like, well, um, it's also now 2,500 students. Turning back to uh, summer school for high school students or connecting with Dan Garcia with his outreach efforts around the joy of computing and... Yeah, so um, this summer we're doing a pre-Data 8 as part of the Summer Edge program, uh, which uh, is mostly bringing students in from minority serving schools. Um, we're also doing a summer offering of this course. Um, yeah. You made the comment earlier in your talk here today that students, that it's, it's not required, but the course is available. How, how do students get to know about Data 8? And... From students, yeah. So um, we've really tried to get that outreach uh, happening. So part of this student group is also communicating to students. Um, the buzz is happening. So um, down the line, it, it, you know, all students should take this. But it's so much better to make it really popular and important and then to worry about the last few percent than it is to try to force it down their throats from the beginning. Ani shared me some of the um, responses, so I thought I'd share those before I go on to other topics, which I guess we'll do a little bit. Um, so, um, uh, <coughs> I guess, um, uh, <coughs> so it's interesting, you know, with this very empirical approach, the perspective is it's really about concepts. Um, this was coming, oh, I got to track it to there. Um, uh, she thought it was very interesting. You know, in some sense, we tend to do pu uh, puzzle solving. Um, and uh, so uh, students love it. Okay. So the other piece of this was these connectors. And so, ah, got to pay attention to that. So uh, here I've got, Previously, I showed you the current semesters. So this was the previous semester's connectors, which are pretty interesting to think about. I mean, you know, this is taught by somebody out of theater. Um, uh, cognitive science, there's now an MCB connector building out. Uh, some of these are on the technical, the rest of the technical development. Um, I'll do a little bit more coming out of demography. Um, children, in, so this one is taking um, household data focusing on student health. So um, what's happened is the connector social network now knits the faculty together. So it's been really interesting to see how these develop. Um, so you take, for example, um, I guess we didn't have a geospatial data analysis in this semester, but we've had almost every semester. Who teaches that? Is that geography? Is that environmental science planning management? Is it urban design? Is it civil engineering? Well, actually, all of them. So in cases like that, when the faculty take it down to basics, then faculty in other departments become partners with there. So it's created these networks across. And in each one of those departments, there's a bunch of other faculty that say, yeah, that's great. But in geography, we have these four other things that would be really great if our students would learn. So you get those. So that's kind of kicked off this really interesting discussion that can only happen from within. Um, Is that somebody from data science reaching out into one of the other disciplines to say, here's an opportunity and I'm going to go help you write the curriculum and I'm going to co-teach it for you? Oh, oh man, you know, such a great... Enough in those other disciplines that they can kind of pick it up on their own and not as reliant on the DS discipline. Uh, yeah, so I wish we had a nice clean. Um, it's this grassroots chaos and we've tried very hard to have a degree of facilitation around it. So we do weekly uh, connector meetings. I have now an undergrad that is served. Previously, there was a postdoc that kind of did some of that. And you know, it's a huge amount of stuff. In many cases, they may be postdocs. We're starting to get more faculty. Um, so yeah, 
um, and how do you scale it? And, and it was really hard when the main course was evolving and would they admit to what it was. So that's been, it is amazing we've succeeded like we have to get here. But part of it, so the students help a lot. In the first semester, all, and it continues, well, the, the faculty teaching them would try to do it their own way. And about six weeks in, the students said, why are you doing that to me? Let me show you. And so what we've done is we've sent the students out now. So there's a whole student group that works with these to help them build, bring their materials in and whatnot. So bottom up. Um, this was uh, one, I mean, a CS PhD in a civil engineering department did one on uh, transportation. Um, so you kind of have a nice picture here of the underlying problem of this massive set of how do I get people from an origin to a destination, um, viewing the Bay Area transportation system. So, you know, wonderful set of things that can really get into complicated, messy, got to understand a bit, get excited about modern uh, civil engineering. Um, uh, uh, another civil engineering faculty, actually the vice chair for undergraduate matters, is doing one on time series analysis and sea level rise. Um, and so what I captured for you here was um, there's a sequence of quite technical extensions to what we do in the main course, all tied in with, you know, this, the, the world that these students are growing into. So I thought I'd show you in a little more detail one of them. So brand new faculty member into demography doing a social networks connector. So um, starts out teaching them survey methods. And very often you do this in the connector, you do things in the discipline while they're getting some headway in the main course um, about you know, where you came from. And then you begin to codify it and all of the students from Los Angeles mostly had friends from Los Angeles. So they become a part of their data. And then at that point, well, actually, this notion of homophily is well studied, and we can formalize it mathematically, and we can compute with it, and we can begin to do something with it. And then they begin to go off and coming up with their own measurements and whatnot and start computing uh, properties of social networks that are appropriate to the field. And you know, of course, then you bring in all these other data sources. And so this was going on during the election. And so they looked at a bunch of relationships like co-sponsorship of bills between Democrats and Republicans and Twitter relationships amongst those. So, you know, begin to understand. Um, so as an example of a kind of thing, putting these together. Connector questions? So the question throughout from day one was, when will the major be ready? And so last semester, John took a little survey. Um, so 60, six, two thirds of the students in that 500 person class were very interested to, exceptionally to very interested in a major. So there's a little bit of demand. Um, so the way that's shaping up is this initial experience. Um, then as you go through your lower division, you need to develop a certain amount more computing and mathematics to really be able to engage more deeply and become a data scientist. While you're also doing a lot of your breadth and the rest of your general education, um, take that integrative experience codify it once again much more deeply as you approach the upper division where you can go into a much uh, greater technical depth and start applying it to all of these real world questions. Um, this ends up doing quite a bit of heavy lifting because the more advanced courses are drawn upon existing statistics, computer science, IEOR kind of courses, including you know, getting them to where they can take a really deep machine learning. Um, and so it's 
not just the three VET diagrams, you want to complement that with a concentration, typically an application domain focused in an area. To do that effectively, what you actually want to do is start that concentration in the lower division, because these advanced courses will have some. So they have to start thinking, I might want to major. I should be thinking about some of these uh, going forward, um, and a social context element. So uh, this, within Berkeley, there's a concept of a group major. So this could actually, so there's a bunch of constraints that kick in. Um, but the notion here is it's a, it's a major, but it's carefully designed and yet interdisciplinary about integrative, that it's both technically deep and conceptual, contextualized and grounded in the, in the real world. Um, so more on this. It's a, going to prove to be another one of these interesting exercises of getting faculty all on the same page. You know, and you kind of have to have it as a constrained optimization problem, because almost every faculty member thinks that they need to do you know, 47 units of their specialty. And you know, that's going to come at the cost of something else. Um, so a uh, notion there is to get enough structure where there's many pass through that students could specialize it towards their interest while making sure that all of those paths meet certain guidelines. Um, so I thought I'd do a little bit more on this Data 100 course as part of that. Um, unless there's more questions um, here on, I can tell you thoughts. None of this is approved or even close to that. So there's committee talk. Um, OK. So. Uh, Principles and techniques of data science as a bridge to the upper division. That's how we're thinking about it. Um, a somewhat smaller uh, multidisciplinary team. So these four faculty, um, most of whom you probably know uh, in statistics and computer science. Um, and several of the TAs for the course, these in particular built the Data 8 course and then graduated into building the upper division course. Um, so uh, um, really focus on this notion of, of empowerment. Uh, but part of what's going on is those upper division courses were designed assuming you came through a lower division for that major. So it's got to do a bunch of kind of impedance matching to make sure that students are, are available to tackle those as well. Um, and um, Part of what's really coming out and, and having the stats representation really focus on uh, what is the experience. So the organizing principle of this course, in some sense, is the data science life cycle. And so how do we really emphasize framing of questions, exploring, understanding? And, and you know we all know that that life cycle really looks like that, right? So. Um, the, I'll show you the flow of the course. The first version um, sought to do a full trip around the life cycle early on and then go through each of it much more carefully to go deeper. So I'll, I'll show you a bit more about that. Um, so um, you know, <clears throat> much more about preparation and representation. Um, here it's not magic anymore. We really want to focus on scalability and efficiency so you can move towards tackling problems of scale, um, while at the same time go much more deeply into experimental design and that back and forth. Um, yeah, there's a bit more in the exploratory, but what we're, we're now ready to do is to go more deeply into the uh, algorithmic techniques. Um, so uh, this will change, but it's a step. So. What we did was to try to do a first time through the entire life cycle to get all, of, and this is essentially the instructors working through a data science example in some context. Um, uh, getting deeply, so they get here with Joe Hellerstein, of course, you're going to have a significant amount of data wrangling. They get experience with trifecta tools and putting up their Postgres servers. Um, uh, goes quite a bit further in the statistical modeling and in the machine learning. Um, and um, uh, pushing it out at scale. Um, so um, let's see. 
So uh, looking at that integrative notion, so this was kind of pulling that aspect out of the course, the ways in which, um, so, you know, bootstrap methods for hypothesis testing in native SQL on a Heroku cloud. Would it be an example of an experience in a week? Um, or using maximum likelihood ex um, estimation for um, irregular data coming out of web crawlers, things like that. Um, uh, they, so, you know, a bunch of different in-depth examples, for example, food safety uh, and so forth. Um, so I figured one of the questions would come up is, okay, so what technologies do they get exposed to? So um, this was taking a little survey of what, you know, so here that's what we're after. Okay. Um, so let me kind of close with philosophizing a little bit, touching on some of the other less structured pieces. Um, so one was this notion of supporting the faculty as they move forward. Um, so one of the things we've done is to put together this faculty short course in the summer. So a week-long course where the, four, the front door is focused on pedagogy, and in the process, we learn what it is the students are actually learning. So this is amazing experience with, you know, faculty from Near Eastern Studies being, you know, in deep in conversation with the chair of economics. And, you know, it, it was, um, this is a sense of this student team supporting. Um, but part of this is to enable faculty in lots of places to create bite-sized week-long modules. So um, this was a little, some of the pilot modules um, they're using the physical plant of the main course. They're using its tools, but they're much more focused in uh, what the students start with. Um, and so i give you a little sense of, um, so we have an American cultures requirement. So uh, one of the module developments was a director of that program that took the short course, and she's now looking at a, a American culture's data course, kind of interesting piece. Um, uh, the other side of it is, man, are these students incredible assets for research happening everywhere on campus. So we started this whole program of getting them connected into their research experience. And they will do things that you can, not only will the grad students thumb their nose at it, but they're not as good at it. Um, so uh, these are getting pretty exciting. Um, there's also a handful of now, a number of other courses are taking the traditional elements in some discipline. So this is a couple in statistics, both at the lower division and a problem, you know, this would be the theory course uh, now in this. So many courses, we're having this huge debate about the math department redesigning the linear algebra course that had half a quarter of ODEs and PDEs, and it really ought to do PCA and, and uh, singular value decomposition. So these kind of conversations about rethinking traditional pieces are sort of everywhere. <sighs> so that kind of brings us back to this beginning, um, you know, the heart of a 20th century university. So, um, you know, at Berkeley, we have colleges that have a bunch of divisions. Divisions is really our operational unit in college is some kind of conceptual unit that does admissions and graduations. And they're big areas, you know, the social sciences, these meta organizations. Um, and you know, engineering is essentially a mono-divisional college. And then we have a bunch of professional schools that are mono-divisional schools. And, you know, at some level, right at the heart, there's no data and computational sciences. There's no place that brings those related disciplines together. Um, so that's what's happening now, is creating a division. And it's a really interesting question, because it's not at all clear that it wants to be walled off as a school or a college. It wants to be integrated with rather than differentiated from. It wants to be a part of rather than a part from, even though 
you know, so you could put that division in engineering or you could put it in both. So these are um, what's, and it's clear, you know, statistics very likely moves into that and EECS and maybe operations research or IOR as we call it. Um, but, uh, you know, what are the pieces that come out of quantitative social sciences or come out of information and public policy, computational biology, new media. So how do you constitute that? How do you maintain that culture of being connected? You've all seen these kind of data. Uh, you know, I love the average class size is 23 units. We're probably now producing more data science than the rest of the nation on an annual basis already. And we have only, um, there was a recent uh, article that came out of the Business Higher Education Forum, um, you know, two and a third million postings last, no, two years ago. But, you know, two thirds of employers expect that this is essential to getting a job. And less than a quarter of university leaders think that their graduates will have those. Are we, so, In some sense, so this is, you know, how do we get to the point where in the 21st century, every student graduating from college is prepared to formulate and understand arguments based on data? Thank you. Do you have an online version of the class? And if not, what do you think it would take, it would take to move this to an online version? So, um, not the organized one. Every one of the lecture videos is online and available. Every one of the labs, projects, lectures, all of those are notebooks. And the materials are themselves the textbook. So uh, I see this in many ways as more valuable than the organized online in this sphere because it allows people really to pull it down. I mean, it's different than the certification program or the intense machine learning experience. So I actually think that's a very valuable place right now. Um, it's certainly been a question. Um, there's been online programs that Anthony Joseph offered through edX uh, on Databricks in machine learning data science. He actually borrowed a lot of these materials to integrate into his course. Um, so there are now two, and that was 150,000 students. So it was it was pretty big, um, but um, I think it's actually a lot more valuable to get these materials and techniques into the universities themselves in person. So we're much more focused there. Um, we did do a webinar that was co-sponsored by the American Statistical Association and the Computer Research Association. Um, CRA was slow getting to it, so all the slots filled up on the ASI members. So we had about 250 schools, most of which had half a dozen faculty in the room watching it together. So it's moving pretty quickly into uh, faculty. I mean, Yale, right, rebranded their statistics department. I mean, you don't get much more conservative than that. So the, the dean of social sciences at Yale came up and spent two days with us really studying these things. Um, um, Harvard is addicted to the connector concept. Um, so that was another interesting one. Um, we thought of it initially as this appreciation two-unit freshman seminar, get a taste. You know, instead of doing this little reading, you could, you could allow students to understand what cognitive science was like you know, from a more hands-on quantitative. So that was brilliant for a reason we didn't expect. Um, if we had made those three units, then they would have had to go through all sorts of approval hurdles. But they were these little foot in the door. Now, a large fraction are saying, well, you know, this is really a three-unit course. But they already own it. They love it. The students love it. And so then all of a sudden it counts for students' breadth requirements. And so the stuff is kind of working its way up into satisfying things for the students. So that 
piece of the subversive aspect was, in hindsight, brilliant. Some students watch the uh, uh, lectures just on video, and they don't come to class, or does everyone come to class? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so um, uh, that's been a question of how best to do that. And John De Niro, uh, when he teaches the CS course, the vast majority don't come to class because there's 2,500 of them. Um, we decided this; it was really important. So. We now do have some mechanisms to bring students into the classroom for the main lecture. There's still quite a mix, um, but we decided that it actually really is, a lot of it is pretty experiential. You get some of it from the lecture, but um, he, it's pretty amazing. This seeds enough questions that you can do. It's not flipped by any means, but you get opportunities where you can have a buzz of students working through ask, and then sorting it out. You'll, Kind of see it in watching the lecture. So we think that that we're going to go to a thousand next term, and um, so you know that's pushing it at that level. Other questions? Yeah. You mentioned a couple of things that you thought were very good for building the program the way it's manifest. Is there anything that you did that, in hindsight, now feels constraining, or you wish you had not done or done differently? So um, the DS100 faculty feel that this helical approach didn't work. Um, they are really struggling. They used really interesting data sets. And they spent too much time trying to understand what the heck was the data set. So that's a delicate mix. Um, there's, there's aspects of this that are quite labor intensive. So we were able to do it because it was so much a labor of love. Um, but is that replicable more generally? Not so clear. Um, I'm pretty so I actually for you know, I might say connectors should have been three units so that they uh, would be of value to the students, but actually it was great that we didn't do that. Um, The process of repurposing existing requirements rather than creating new ones was fabulous. So, um, you know, that's one. And several times, literally, the chancellor would utter words on, or vice chancellors of the data science requirement, and the antibodies just kicked in. Um, so, you know, it was harder, more chaotic to do it without that. And to, but I really think it was the right thing to do. So I'm feeling pretty good about um, the other, you know, nobody builds programs from the bottom up. They take the graduate stuff and move it in the upper division, and then they move it down. I, I wouldn't do it very many times, but for this, doing it the other direction was exactly right. It, it does mean we're under more than a little bit of pressure right now to get those upper division courses built. And you, three years from now, we might argue that if we had approached it in a more systematic way, we would have got those done more quickly, whereas we'll get it done more organically, more slowly. But in a place like Berkeley, I don't think we could have got it anywhere, any other way, because the faculty are all so headstrong that they won't let anyone tell them what to do. The big question is um, we have a pretty rarefied student body. And you know this is still true for Yale and Harvard, and you know so it'll be very interesting. You know UMass is a, a a little different than us, and they're adopting these, so that we'll get more data about how broadly it translates in the next few years. But right now we're feeling pretty good. Yeah. From the ECS curriculum perspective, you are basically what you, uh, the data science is doing is expanding uh, the coverage of certain concepts, statistics and methods and terms. Um, but that take away the credit hours, right? So then what, what are the concepts we should retire from our ECS degree? Yeah, so um, we still have an ECS degree. Right. Oh, so this is a complete data science. It's a completely different degree. The question shows up everywhere, though. So back when we were doing the original Deseret, the rapid action, we took testimony from a bunch of majors. 
And the general formula is we create a major and then we fill it up to re with requirements until the student's plate is full. And then we run it like that forever. And so for every major, the answer was we absolutely need our students to know this and they absolutely can't take any of these courses. And you go look at the data that I showed you in the slides and the answer is they are doing it anyways. And they're losing sleep over it. So um, this notion of actually trying to do more in the same amount of time is working. So now they satisfy a statistics requirement None of those had a computational requirement, but now while they're satisfying their statistics, they get a better statistics course and they learn some computing. So uh, there's, it's, you know, we are not perfectly efficient by any means in the university. So the idea that we can't optimize everywhere, anywhere is pretty wild. Though the zero sum game is always where that conversation starts. We should, we should drop. Okay. Thank you all.